Three decades ago, Scotland's game was riding high on its proud history. A heritage that produced world-renowned leaders who transcended class and culture. Heroes to the working class communities they came from, who in turn unified the whole nation. But the times were changing. A new wave of political doctrine had emerged, placing money above everything. Popular capitalism is nothing less than a crusade to enfranchise the many in the economic life of the nation. To be a success in the new era called for a new type of leader, one that would keep one eye on the ball and the other on business. In 1986, the first of many dynamic characters determined to shake the game up did it in his own inimitable style. I'm a professional footballer who plays for money. I'm not ashamed that I've always said that, I've always been open about that. I play for money. Three players to his right, he's picked out Sunis, who picks out a beauty. Graham Sunis was already an international star. He had scaled the heights of European football and was one of the highest earners in the game. He was probably a superstar at that time. He hears Sunis. He was a master tactician and a dominant presence on the pitch. We all know he could be really physical, but he was a brilliant footballer. Sunis now redirected his career, setting his sights on football management. His target? Rangers, one of the giants of football. After years of decline, the club was badly in need of a major revamp. Rangers gates were down to, I think, 15,000. We hadn't won the league for nine years. People were totally fed up with it all. And we lit a fire. So, gentlemen, welcome our new player manager, Graham Sunis. Scotland's international football captain, Graham Sunis, signed on as Rangers. You can speculate that Rangers are making Sunis one of Britain's highest paid managers. His first move was to initiate one of the biggest spending sprees in the history of the Scottish game. Him coming to Ibrox, even as a player, raised everybody's eyebrows. But as a manager, everybody knew that this was light and blue touch paper and retire 10 yards. We knew this was going to be a really fractious, argumentative, dramatic move in Scottish football. I thought I was aware how big a club Rangers uh, was, um, but I quickly realised they were far bigger than I had imagined. Do you think Sunis can bring back the flag to Ibrox? I think within two years, two three years, easy. But Sunis wasn't prepared to wait that long. I wasn't used to losing. I wasn't used to failure. I'd just been a succession of winning things and captain of my country. And I didn't see any fear in it. His appointment coincided with a barren period for the game in England. Clubs were banned from lucrative European competition for five years due to a wave of hooliganism. In an audacious move, Sunas pounced for one of the best-known names in world football, Terry Butcher, the England international captain. We see Terry as the best player of his type in the world today. We trained on the Albion, which is now a car park, crossing the main ground at Ibrox, and I spoke to David Cooper and uh, I said to him, look, look, Davey, you know, if I do join, will we win the league? And he says, yep, yeah, no problem, big man, you join, absolute certainty. There we go. Graham Souness had agreed a fee, I think it was 750,000, and he paid cash. The traffic was always across the border heading south, and suddenly the best players in England were coming to Scottish football. That was quite remarkable and significant. Big players were eager to try the hand in European football. It was revolutionary. I mean, English internationals playing in Scottish football. Uh, it was just unheard of. My aim is to bring the best here. And obviously, that's going to cost a lot of money. You don't think you're going to miss the, the, the challenge of English league football? I think if you, if you ask any Scotsman that up here, they'd, they'd laugh at you. Scotland was a better league than the English top flight because there was much more interest. There was European football. There was all the internationals going up there. It was a phenomenal place to be. I didn't know Graham Sunez at the time, played against him, but, you know, big plans for Ibrox, big plans for the club and everything else like that. And 
and I really bought into it. Right from his very first game as player manager, Souness made it clear he would never back away from a fight. I was ready for it. I was fearless. I've never felt fearful playing in a game of football. The bigger the challenge, the more I like to think I rose to it. This combative approach and huge spending power having an immediate effect. And there is Terry Butcher, the first Englishman to hold that League Cup trophy aloft. That breakthrough success opening the floodgates. And there it is, the final whistle. Rangers have won the league and on come the supporters. The crowd have gone berserk. He brought a swagger and a sense of confidence and brought that sense of invincibility, or if not invincibility, simply, you know, who are you? Who are you looking at? Sunshine. And he raised the game for everyone. There was this severe paradigm shift of depression and misery to money, success. So if it wasn't a revolution, it was certainly something incredibly exciting and innovative. It was just complete change. Souness, however, was not the only manager shaking up Scottish football with a new and distinctive approach. There had been other examples on the East Coast. Success had been achieved at Aberdeen under Alex Ferguson at a fraction of the cost of their Glasgow rivals. Ferguson's great success would eventually see him lured to one of the biggest clubs in England. At Dundee United, Jim McLean was also riding high but without access to a blank checkbook. There is a man who totally transformed the face of football in this city. Recognising their limitations, McLean led them through the most successful period in their history. The second goal, there it goes, it's a goal! only the fourth Scottish club to reach a European final. Although they fell short in the ultimate test against Gothenburg in 1987, the scale of McLean's achievements were obvious to the club's fans. I don't think I've ever seen a crowd stand like this for a defeated side. That chapter with Jim McLean and Dundee United stands equal with anything we've, we've done in Scottish football in the last 50 years. At times, McLean seemed to regard the players as the sole property of his club. Players were famously tied up on long-term contracts during a period where the balance of power between player and club still lay very much in favour of the clubs. Something I always think was paramount to our success was Jim McLean had a policy that we all stayed within eight miles of the city. We would socialise with each other quite a lot. Our wives were close. We were a close bunch of guys. We trained a lot. We were really fit. Even Christmas Day we could train because we all stayed here. So if things weren't any good, you, you were quickly told with supporters, you know, you need to, things need to improve. Have a good night tonight then, eh? I'm more babysitting than anyway. Babysitting? Will you be drunk babysitting Yes, thank you very much, Paul. Well done, Logan! We had dietitians, sports scientists, fitness coaches, psychologists um, in the early 80s, long before they became popular. Where he let himself down was his man management. Everybody's feet at the same. They're all battered with the same brush. For all that he was a tin pot dictator, for all that he might have flouted the United Nations conventions on human rights, I mean, he was a great football figure. His ways wouldn't work now. I played reserve team football at 15 against men. Now, physically, you couldn't handle it, but mentally, you, you, you grew stronger and you grew stronger quicker. 
And we had experienced players who literally would punch you if you weren't doing the right things. There was none in this molly coddling you, you got a whack. And uh, you either grew up or you, you got shipped out, simple as that. McLean made light of United's financial disadvantages and applied his forceful personality to the pursuit of greatness. It's a small club, it's a provincial club, and uh, we have to cut all corners to try and stay competing at the top, uh, save money wherever we can. McLean also had views on the very structure and future of the game, believing that to have 42 professional clubs was unsustainable. I honestly believe that uh, clubs would be more successful if they joined ranks and pooled resources than at the moment where it, uh, it spread far too thin over the ground. His contemporaries had achieved success by following the money. Alex Ferguson, now at the helm of one of the richest clubs in the world, would go on to achieve spectacular success. But McLean, fearing his club would soon be too small and impoverished to compete, had ambitious plans. And in 1999, he attempted to consume his city rival, Peter Mars Dundee FC. Oh, it was very close to happening, and the, the merger was very, very close to happening. It was within two or three days, I believe, of happening. People don't remember, or certainly some people don't want to remember, that that deal was done. Those two teams on a Friday night had merged. They had come up with a new name. They had come up with the strip they would play in. And on a Monday morning, it had all changed. What had happened had been some incident in a nightclub with, I think it was Rob Douglas, who was married to the daughter of Peter Marr. Peter Marr came on and said, I'm not going to put my family through this, and it was off. Jim McLean, who really wanted the merger, and the proof is there, um, asked me in every way to get that back on the table, but Peter wasn't for it. It was more a takeover than a merger, I believe. Um, but hey, it's historic now, I'm not want to stir things up in between. I've never said a thing about um, my neighbours up the road. Um, we're both important for each other in the city, and yeah, it, it never happened. Jim McLean had responded to the increasing financial pressures by suggesting the unthinkable. In the end, it hadn't worked. Those financial pressures meant that football was now more vulnerable than ever to people who saw it mainly in terms of the money it could generate. Most people don't understand how you can acquire A, a famous football club, and then B, turn it into a strong company with merely a £100,000 capital. I mean, a lot of intelligent people have said, how on earth did you do that? Claiming to be a lifelong fan, Solicitor David Duff was given a seat on the Hibernian Football Club board in 1987. It remains to me, even to this day, a mystery as to who exactly was David Duff. He's very much an enigmatic character in the history of Scottish football, not someone that is well known, not someone that even in a pub quiz you would necessarily come up with his name. And I think the enigma around him is what was he really trying to achieve? Duff attracted the attention of Conservative Party Treasurer-in-Waiting and tax exile David Rowland, who agreed to bankroll an acquisition of the Edinburgh Club, but only if the Hibernian fans were also encouraged to fork out. With the use of bizarre TV advertising, the fans were gently persuaded to empty their pockets. The most important person at Easter Road is an Alec Miller, Peter Cormack, John Collins or Steve Archibald. It's you, Hibs fans. While the team plays its part in the park, we know our fans play theirs. There's no substitute for that. <laughs> the Hebs fans bought shares in huge numbers, and a profit of about £1.5 million found its way back to David Rowland. But hidden in the small print of the newly formed Hibernian PLC was the acquisition of a loss-making restaurant chain trading in the south of England and owned by one of David Rowland's companies. Hemorrhaging massive debt, it dragged Hibbs into receivership. I think it pointed to some of the issues that we see later in Scottish football, where the club is not only overextending itself, but more importantly, starting to get involved 
by a curious circuitous route in other forms of business. And of course these are very different businesses, they're not run in the same kind of way and whatever. And it ended up to him spiralling into economic chaos basically and made them uniquely vulnerable to being taken over. With the club on its knees, Duff was ordered to an emergency board meeting where he discovered there was to be a hostile takeover of Hibernian and learned the identity of the individual behind it. David Rowland said, who is the worst person you could imagine that would, be, that would bid for the company? And I speculated a few names that I won't repeat, uh, but not the right one. And Jeremy kept saying, no, worse than that, worse than that, the very worst person. The Hearts chairman, Willis Mercer, strode into an Edinburgh hotel this afternoon to announce the boldest takeover bid British football has ever had. This morning, Art Midlothian PLC submitted an offer um, for the full issued share capital of Edinburgh Hibernian PLC. His idea of taking over Hibernian Football Club was totally a disastrous idea. It shouldn't come as a cultural shock, the thought of putting together two teams who have been competitors for a hundred years or so. Disgraceful. You're going to go yourself. Go here. Go to a new club. No go danger. Here. No danger. Everybody who, who really understands football knows that you can't have Ying without Yang, you can't have Hearts without Hibs, you can't have Rangers without Celtic, and you cannot, you must not ever effectively deprive people of their football loyalties. You can't do that. Wallace Mercer's plan was to sell both of the valuable city centre club grounds and build a new all-seater stadium on the outskirts of Edinburgh. But unlike other businesses, most football clubs were still firmly rooted in strong communities. With their fans ready to be called upon as a last line of defence. Keep your predator hands off the Berlin football club. It was a very modern campaign in that sense, but it preceded social media, so it wasn't done through forums or anything like that. It was done through concerts, through raising money, through the buckets in the streets, uh, through handouts, flyers and things like that. More was at stake than just the club's history. Identity, trust in its owners, and the fans' dignity were also on the line. The community cared enough to believe it could make a difference as the campaign took hold. They had a rally in Usher Hall, and he asked me to go along to, to, just to show support to, to the Hibs players, because, you know, that was the other thing that was involved. If, you know, if the teams were to merge, you know, at least one full squad of 30-odd players would have been lost. And I told the truth. I just felt that the city was big enough for both clubs. I didn't agree with it. I knew a lot of the lads in the Hearts dressing room didn't agree with it. Um, and didn't feel it was right, which didn't go down too well with the chairman. It was probably the, close to the club's darkest hour, and everybody who was part of Hands Off Hibs deserves great credit for the passion that they showed and the determination they showed to save the football club. And that's part of the recurring theme within football. Supporters are passionate about the football club and just want the best for the club. The relentless campaigning piled pressure on David Duff and his business partners. At the very last moment, they held on to their shares and the deal fell through. Since the takeover campaign began, a simmering undercurrent of aggression stalked the city, aimed mostly at Wallace Mercer. The fact of having a 24-hour guard in my family but the police, bricks through windows. I mean, really, it is so parochial, it is so short-sighted, and in the end, it really is quite sickening. Good ball through to Foster, he's got Robertson in the middle. John Robertson! Just weeks later, the pent-up anger boiled over. The fans displaying their rage at the bungled attempt to dismantle their club communities. We have an incident on the field, and several players having to race forward, fans invading the park. The place was packed to the rafters, and it was a horrible atmosphere. You know, Hibs fans were, were going bananas, and rightly so. Hearts fans weren't too happy about it either. We were the, the Antichrist at the time, we were the enemies. Well, there have been chats throughout the game against the Hearts chairman, Wallace Mercer, who's not here this afternoon. 
but no matter what's happened during the summer, there can be no excuse for these disgraceful scenes, these quite dreadful scenes. Tensions erupted, and the police, inadequately prepared and completely misjudging the volatile atmosphere, lost control. The game was suspended several times, but the team struggled on until half-time, when John Robertson led Hearts off the pitch three goals ahead. We came at half-time and in came the, the match commander, a couple of policemen says, look, we fear another pitch invasion, you know. We're going to basically say, if you score another goal and head fans invade, you know, we may have to stop the game, we'll have to stop the game, so, you know, if you can help it, don't score. Uh, and we were all looking stunned, thinking, you know, some some strange request. That, and he went out the door, Santa Claus, yeah, yeah, no problem at all, Officer, thanks very much, yep, yeah, you know where he's coming from, we'll leave it that, shut the door, and just says, nah, that, that ain't happening, guy. And there, in fact, goes the final whistle. Pibbs lost the game, but claimed victory in their battle with Wallace Mercer. It wasn't the love of football that brought David Duff to Hibbs. It was the lure of making money, and when that didn't happen, it was time to leave. The biggest lesson is that you can't really trust anybody, and um, I just went away from it there. David Duff did move away, and eventually into prison. Convicted of fraud in 1993 after swindling hundreds of thousands of pounds from numerous banks and building societies. An appropriate omen for the shape of things to come. Financial turmoil became a common feature of the game. And no club, regardless of size or pedigree, was immune. For over a century, Celtic Football Club had been under the control of a group of close-knit families. Resistant to change, these custodians were stuck in a rut, increasingly disconnected from their supporters. Somebody's got to do something, because the board are just going to sit there indefinitely, and you've got to let them know what the feelings are. What was actually going on at Celtic, in the accounts, and in the way that money was spent, and where the money ended up? because they certainly weren't spending it on players, they weren't spending it on the stadium. Their attitude to football supporters was to treat them like scum. You, you, you'll have no voice, keep giving us the money, don't ask any questions about where it's going, and behave yourselves. And it wasn't long after that where the fanzine phenomenon began and became a real thorn in the flesh. They began asking questions about how football fans have been treated, Liam Brady, who was then the Celtic manager, he actually said to me, do you think Celtic are going to go under? That was the Celtic manager not sure about what the future held for the club and everything else. The old family dynasty, it was ancient. It belonged to another era and it was time to move on. And they were not capable of modernising that club. And that's what had to happen. You had the famous headline of the hearse outside Parkhead, which was in one of the Sunday tabloids, which caused a lot of ill feeling. And out of all of this, at the 11th hour, the saviour arrived, Fergus McCann. The so-called saviour brought with him new business ideas and a fresh vision to a club and football system bereft of direction and purpose. McCann, a lifelong fan and self-made travel tycoon, had watched from his home in Canada as the club's fortunes declined. He responded to desperate pleas from supporters to mount a rescue. I had £11 million sitting in an account to show that funds were there. I was not an illusion. I was not some guy with other people's money or no money and all the rest. Has he got any money? Has he got any money? It was sitting there. The bank exercised a squeeze play. You know, by noon, by a certain day, if you don't pay off, we will foreclose and we'll take over the assets and we'll put you into administration. So I responded to that and, and paid that off. I only paid off the bank. I did not have control of the shares or the company on that day. 
For 48 hours, McCann was trapped in a financial no man's land. With the assistance of director Brian Dempsey, he attempted to hammer out a deal for full control. The club's bankers warned the club was in peril of being put in. Deputy the Chairman David Smith had arrived in Glasgow saying he would. Do you mislead the board over the current state of the finances? Absolutely not. The old board, under siege, held the line. The fans gathered on the doorstep and the media waited for answers. A lot of us journalists were holed up at Celtic Park while all these negotiations were going on. And it was the end of the negotiations. And out of a side door, uh, Fergus McCann appeared, quickly followed by David Smith, one of the uh, Celtic directors. And David Smith walked and he opened the door for Fergus and he said, uh, good night, Fergus. And Fergus McCann kept his head down. He said, goodbye, Mr. Smith. The game is over. The Rebels have won. No! We have new people, a new plan, a new vision, and the strength to go forward. McCann's five-year strategy involved giving the supporters a stake in the club's future and building a new state-of-the-art stadium. He actually saved Celtic. Celtic would have been out of business had it not been for him and Brian Dempsey. It was about giving fans more of a, an interest in their club in terms that they could buy shares, which was largely unheard of here. He gave the fans a new belief. He did not think within the traditional parameters of Scottish football. He came with new ideas. It went against the grain with some people. So he was different. McCann's radical approach to the business of football appeared to be deliberately misunderstood by an increasingly hostile media. His focus was utterly clear-cut about making Celtic uh, a great, powerful force in the game. He would keep on saying, we don't do things conditioned to appease the press. We do the right things and we deal with the repercussions. The football authorities frequently questioned many of his American-style commercial practices. McCann was issued with an order to appear before them for enticing another team's manager to join his club. Celtic has been fined a record sum of £100,000. The fine is the largest ever in the history of Scottish Celtic football. Celtic could be expelled from the Scottish League unless they pay a £100,000 fine within the next two weeks. You can't have this football association with football rules and football laws deciding to penalise to that extent. Just to, you know, I felt that was vindictive and it was unnecessary and excessive and was intending to go to a real court, which, by the way, under the football rules, you're not allowed to do. They have a rule in the football rules, which is an illegal rule, namely, you can't use the law. Now, nobody is above the law. And when the SFA chief executive, Jim Farry, mysteriously delayed a big player transfer, McCann went to war. That was an example of maybe, a, if you like, a panjandrum, if you want to call him that. He made the rules that he thinks he would write, he'd do things his way. It's all about, we're going to show this guy, McCann, who's in charge here. Well, you can't, and uh, you can't prejudice a given club and on a given day doing as he did, and um, he paid the price. The Scottish Football Association has suspended its chief executive, Jim Farry. They have been forced into an apology to Celtic, and the finger of blame is clearly being pointed at the chief executive. Much of this ongoing conflict between the old and the new was played out in the media, with the personalities involved providing endless stories for the so-called fans with typewriters. Thank you. When I started in journalism, sports writers and journalists in general still had this amazing divine privilege, almost, that when, when the newspaper hit the doormat the next morning, you revealed the news to the world. The main purpose of producing a newspaper is to sell more than your rivals. 
sell as many as possible by any legal, barely legal means possible. And, and football sells. The new world of sports media gave the fans what they wanted. More column inches about football. But for the clubs, controlling the media was still a new challenge. Ayrshire businessman David Murray had amassed a fortune in the steel and property industry and had a deep interest in sport, particularly his local club, Air United. He was looking to get involved in Air because his family are from there and I said it's a mistake. I think if you have the money you could buy Rangers and that's how it turned out. We got on very well and we became great friends. Murray and Souness shared a similar outlook and world view, and both were fiercely ambitious. Murray purchased Rangers in 1988 with aspirations to join the European elite. In a bold move, he further extended his empire into the media business, creating his own newspaper. Aware that a new era of football public relations had dawned, Murray discovered that feeding the media was preferable to fighting it. David Murray liked to hold court, um, which was great for the media. The old journalists got sweeties from David, and hence David was the king, and David's challenger, Fergus, was the village idiot. Fergus was never prepared to try and compete by giving sweeties to the media. And if you don't give sweeties to the media, they don't like you and they hurt you and they treat you badly. David Murray had the media in his pocket and he had very good methods for doing it. And we knew what the methods were and we discussed the methods at Celtic and, and decided not to follow them. But we knew how he was going about it and it worked. David Murray deployed shrewd manipulation of the media as well as continuing his aggressive financial approach to running Rangers. Very quickly you realised that he was a person who was going to spend whatever it would take to make Rangers successful in Europe. We have applied for a work permit last Friday for all our good snacks off the Russian captain. He started to build and build and build and build and spend, spend, spend and get players in and lay the foundations in for the dominance that Rangers had in Scottish football at that time. If we weren't doing well, we'd lost a couple of games, a new player would arrive. It was just wonderful. That was the first indication that anyone got that so, you know, Rangers were going to um, up the ante. And uh, after that, very, very difficult for any of the Scottish clubs to compete against them. At that time, nobody was talking about is David Murray spending too much money. Everyone was just going, Brian Loudrop, wow, world class. You know, there was no sense that this was anything other than normal. This was it. This is what Rangers do, and this is, this is going to continue, and it's, the next superstar is going to be in the door pretty soon. Paul Gascoigne finally concluded his much-heralded move to Glasgow Rangers to become the club's most expensive ever signing. Our ambitions hold no bounds, and more and more money will become available. This will be a regular feature at Rangers. He enjoyed that roller coaster. He enjoyed high stakes, taking risks, taking the club on this exciting journey, and a lot of people bought into it, including, and I don't spare myself this, including critical observers who should have been more prescient about it than we were. Rangers are the biggest club in Britain. People better realise that. We used to think we're a big club. We are the biggest club now. Many other clubs copied the Rangers business model but in most cases, simply racked up debt to pay for higher transfer fees and wages. The age of the foreign import had begun. He's done it! He's done it! I think having foreign players there was exciting for the fans and also enriched our game in terms of the way it was going to be played. It was more about the money. People who support a local club like the idea of a sort of organic growth of the players coming through the club rather than being bought in. I felt that the clubs, including Rangers, went too far in getting foreign talent. And clubs were spending, within their own financial context, stupid amounts of money. Look at smaller clubs like Airdrie, for instance. They were buying foreign players. It's just daft. Dundee United were probably as guilty as anybody else. 
of bringing too many foreigners into the game. They probably took a lot of money out of the club and gave us nothing back in return. And then I think everybody jumped in that bandwagon and uh, I think it hurt our game quite badly. The game here became a dumping ground for second, third and sometimes fourth-rate European players. And that's because other clubs thought we have to get foreign players to compete. We neglected the talent on their own doorstep and that kind of withered a bit. And I think that was a bad thing for Scottish football. I think if you go back to the period of um, the escalation of wages and the ability to spend to get the big players, that has an impact on every major club in Scotland. I think that's where the rot sets in. For me, that's where it starts to go hopelessly wrong because it led to an escalation of wages that were over and above what the economy of Scottish football could afford. As the players perform for rapidly expanding wage packets, the fans, treated like cattle, paid to watch them from behind barbed wire fences. After a series of horrific stadium disasters, the government stepped in. Lord Justice Taylor's report into 1989's Hillsborough disaster ordered the clubs to modernise their grounds. 100 pages add up to the bleakest and most damning critique. will be told to penned. scrap their terraces or be shut down. The Taylor report says it's the only way to stop Hillsborough happening again. The change demanded a move from ramshackle terraces to all-seater stadia, adding another huge financial burden to the already overstretched clubs. Rangers had already suffered a horrific stadium tragedy years earlier in 1971. In the aftermath, the club rebuilt Ibrox to the highest safety standards. When they were all spending money on stadiums, we could match Man United or Liverpool or Arsenal, anyone for transfer fees and salaries. At times, the soonest revolution appeared to embrace the political and financial climate of the day, with its emphasis on free markets and deregulation. However, this was not a philosophy shared by most of Scotland. The Conservative Party's policies, the poll tax, de-industrialisation and mass privatisation led to bitter hostility. The national mood was a combination of humiliation, bitterness, worry, deep anxiety, insecurity, perhaps above all, anger. In 1988, Mrs Thatcher made one of her few visits to Scotland when she attended the cup final. A fusion of politics and football. It gave her a chance to appeal to the Scottish voters. It gave the football fans a chance to express their opinion of the political changes of the time. We were all aware that she was the most popular person in Scotland. We lined up in the foyer and uh, she came along the line and met us before the game. So obviously that tells you that uh, they were a bit worried about the reaction that that would get. And there is the Prime Minister, Mrs Thatcher, making her first public appearance. The uh, supporters were given uh, red cards before the Prime Minister arrived and held them up as she appeared in the Royal Box. And reporters from both sides making the noises as the presentation party comes out. Thatcher herself knowing she was losing votes in Scotland in the 1980s uh, and trying to find out why this was, became aware it was not simply because of our policies, it was because also the Protestant working class vote was no longer overwhelmingly going to the Conservatives. That was the first erosion in the sectarian political divide. As Scotland's political landscape evolved, it began to challenge some of the less edifying traditions that had taken root in both society and football. 
Scotland's religious loyalties were also beginning to crumble, and a more tolerant society was emerging. But some football clubs lagged well behind the social momentum. The toxicity of sectarianism had festered for decades on the terraces. Well, there wasn't that uh, divide in the period before 1900, in particular not between Rangers and Celtic. It's only later that the sectarian poison enters the sporting arena. Irish immigrants to Scotland at the turn of the century adopted Celtic, a club founded in the east end of Glasgow to help feed the city's poor. While Ulster Protestants, brought in during the pre-war era to work in the city's shipyards, gravitated towards Rangers. The religious divide that had only previously existed in the confines of worship now found other outlets. In the 20s and early 30s, the Scottish industrial economy virtually collapsed. There was huge levels of emigration, a massive sense of depression. That is the high point of the sectarian history of Scotland. People look for scapegoats and among the scapegoats found were people from an Irish Catholic background who were seen to be threatening the very essence of Scottishism. That is the period in 1923 when the Kip publishes its notorious report and pamphlet, The Menace of the Irish Race to Our Scottish Civilization. The Kip addresses the employers of Scotland, please only hire and promote those, quote, of the Scottish race. Unquote. And Rangers began to adopt, as so many other Scottish corporations did in that period, began to adopt a Protestant only policy in terms of signing. Rangers continued with this approach until Graham Souness was appointed player manager in 1986. On the day he joined the club, he sought a different way forward. I mean, I believe that if you're a Rangers supporter, you want to come here and watch them winning every week. Whether they be whatever colour or whatever religion, if they're doing the business for Rangers, surely that's what the supporters want to see. We've got a lot of traditions in Ibrox, and we don't want to see them broke for the sake of one man. As soon as I know, we like our own traditions. I'd like to see them pick whoever he wants as long as they're Protestant. <laughs> <laughs> In May 1989, waiting in the wings, was a one-time Celtic hero contemplating a homecoming to his old club. I'm really delighted. As I say, there was other, there was other offers, but as I say, there's only one team I want to play for, and that's Celtic. But Johnson had not put pen to paper and signed a contract. Behind the scenes, fierce negotiations continued, resulting in a series of events that reshaped the social and football landscape. I remember I was in the house one day and uh, I got a phone call from my son. Have you heard any rumours about Mo Johnson signing for Rangers? I remember my reply to him distinctly. I said, there is as much chance of me becoming the next Pope as Mo Johnson signing for Rangers. Well, I've came to a really big club, possibly one of the biggest in Europe. Obviously, we can it was stunning. I was in the room. It was utter bedlam. One of the most staggering days I can remember in sports reporting. Mo Johnson will be the first Roman Catholic to play in Rangers' first team. This was an absolutely brilliant signing, and not just in terms of the, the shockwaves that it caused, but because Mo Johnson was at the absolute peak of his power, he was absolutely on top of his form. Brilliant player. I believe he's the best centre forward in British football today. I knew at the time it had to be done. And it was right. It was preventing us going forward as a football club. He was a damn good footballer, that's all that mattered. It wasn't just the fact that Rangers had signed a Catholic, which was big enough. It was the fact that signed that Catholic in that particular manner. I'm a Ranger through and through. No, Protestant You'll not get me at Ivers again. That's it. Why not? Because you signed the Catholic. 
The big thing I remember about the Morris Johnston signing was Graham Souness' determination not to be bound by the sectarian policy which had operated in signing terms really until then. And that blew that apart. Fair play to him. Brave little bugger, he was right up for it. He deserves a lot of credit. Obviously I've got to look to win the Rangers fans over and I think I can do that. This whole thing that, oh, you know, there's people burning scarves outside Ibrox, you're nutters. You know, the, the very few nutters who only saw the religious aspect, but they weren't anything like the majority. Almost every Rangers fan I knew was absolutely delighted because it was one in the eye for Celtic. I think he's a little traitor. He's a mercenary for money. Um, but Rangers are welcome. I think it's a brave signing. The guy's going to get hassled for both sides, Rangers and Celtic supporters. And it goes to Johnston. That's a corner. That's getting pretty tosy. I think it's a brave effort for Rangers to bring them out of the Ibrox. And if you're going to sign a Catholic, you've got to sign a good one. He must be the best. That's what I say. Will you be going back to Ibrox? Certainly. It was sort of a signal to Celtic, even Catholics want to play for us. That's how good we are now. Johnston, and he scored! A very, very big watershed for Scottish football and a much needed watershed in so many respects. We suddenly realised the world had changed. It was transformational. It was very difficult to appreciate what had just happened to Scottish football. That was a sign for everyone that the club was changing, not only in terms of being able to bring in um, a higher level of player, but also you know, historical aspects of the club that, um, you know, weren't very savoury were going to change as well. The context of the Johnson affair was patently important. We see evidences in that time of the end of labour market discrimination. It's more or less dead by the late 1980s. So what Rangers do is fairly typical. They are coming in for a lot of criticism, virulent criticism, even from ministers of the Church of Scotland. So the temper of the times was changing. It was also a reflection of these deeper movements, sometimes below the surface in Scottish society, which we can also we can see now as we look back. But for many fans, particularly at Celtic and Rangers, intolerance is a way of life, with a proclamation of tribal allegiances part of the match day routine. You must have thought long and hard what you had to do last summer. Has it been all worthwhile? Yes, very much so. Um, the management have backed me, the fans have backed me. Most of all, the players have backed me. I'm delighted. So all these fans watching this tonight... What are you Club going to dressing see? rooms often mirrored the conduct on the terraces. The new Rangers team, which now included Maurice Johnson, were captured in full voice in this previously unseen footage. When I came to Rangers in particular, I got sucked up in it big time, I really did. And for the first couple of years it was fine, he sung the songs and he attended this and did that and all that sort of thing. But I'm one that jumped in with both feet sort of thing and we went the whole hog sort of thing. I remember Rita saying to me one time, you really want to stand back and have a look at yourself and see what you're doing. And I, I did actually, I thought, wow, what, what am I doing? You know, you do get sucked up in it. <clears throat> and you do end up calling people names and you singing the songs and you actually believe it and all that sort of thing. And I'm thinking, wow, hang on a minute. You know, it's, a, it's football, I'm playing for Rangers. I've got my family. I'm not really a religious person, but I'm fine with it. But you ended up, wow, look at me. I've become a different person. And I found that I had to really step back and I had to really, I think I was the only Rangers captain then not to be a Mason and all that sort of thing as well. And, it was, so, you know, whoa, whoa, hang on a minute, where, where are we going with this? Sectarianism reaches far into the soul of Scottish football, but is not exclusive to any one club. Arguments may rage about what constitutes sectarian comment, religious or political. We love the IRA, we love the IRA. To the outsider and to the rest of Scottish football, both things look and sound the same indistinguishable from any other display of intolerance. My own position is that sectarianism is dying 
in, in Scotland. And it, to me, is ironic as an historian that as it dies, it's got much more attention in the public domain and in Scots law than it ever did in its heyday. A decade on from Souness's radical move, Rangers' signing policy had moved on significantly. I think by the time you've got to Amoruso coming along, especially given the fact they ended up captain in the team, I mean, a Catholic captain in Rangers. The symbolism of that is immense. And now I don't think anybody really bats an eyelid. I don't even think it troubles your bigots anymore. The Souness Revolution transformed and reshaped Scotland's social and sporting landscape. But his forceful character often fell foul of the football authorities. And he, like Fergus McCann, attracted some puzzling verdicts. At this point, I've got nothing to say, thank you. A six-month touchline suspension quickly escalated to an unprecedented two-year ban, leaving Souness with limited options. I know Phil have gone as far as I'll be allowed to go in trying to achieve success at this football club. So I feel now would be the best time for me to go. It was becoming too much, it was becoming boring. It should always been about the football club. Instead, it was about me being in trouble for, for different things. The broader impact of the Rangers revolution under Graham Souness was, I think, aspiration. At club level, what you started to see was that the clubs became more important to fans than the national team. And this idea of the emergence of uh, super teams that are capable of competing in Europe, that can play in the bigger tournaments, that can go to finals and win them and whatever, uh, became the real measure of success. And suddenly when Rangers emerged in their nine in a row period, they were the equal of all the big English teams at that time. Rangers' dominance of the Scottish game continued for almost a decade. Walter Smith took over at the helm, with David Murray continuing to bankroll the club's success. The moment belongs to Rangers, the ninth time in a row. The clash of these two very different business models, David Murray's lavish spending and Fergus McCann's more prudent approach, came to a head in May 1998. The cheers ring round Celtic Park. The cautious business plan had won the day, leaving David Murray with a damaged ego. But just weeks later, he set about restoring injured pride with an £87 million spending spree. Ensuring victory for his rivals was only temporary. Today's the largest sum of money we've ever spent on a player, and I'm sure we'll eclipse that again shortly. We, you know, we're not happy having lost our championship, but we've got to pick up the gauntlet that was put down and uh, go and retain the championship. For the victor, Fergus McCann, the celebrations were short-lived. You look back now, bizarre hostility towards him among certain Celtic fans. I mean, it seems crazy now, because at the time he was regarded as being tight-fisted, he wouldn't release money. And on my son, on my right hand is Tom Boy, the captain of Sally Football Club. I couldn't get my head around that. I mean, there should be a statue to Fergus McCann outside the front of Celtic Park. We're sitting here, and we haven't seen a player in over a year. There's no ambition with this wee man. When I was there, it wasn't always people saying I'm a hero by any means. People saying, well, you know, just spend the money, Fergus, spend the money, Fergus. One principle I just followed there is do not do bad deals just because everybody wants you to do the deal. Don't do bad deals. Don't pay £10 million for a £5 million player. I'm a professional footballer. 
The police for money. Who is the worst person you could imagine? You must not ever deprive people of their football loyalties. Wow, but look at me. I've become a different person. I don't even think it troubles your bigots anymore. The rebels have won. Yeah! Our ambitions hold no bounds. Football had been transformed. The landscape of the game in Scotland had been changed out of all recognition, and some major figures had emerged. But the increasing focus was on everything except football. Absurd amounts of money, a voracious media, inflated egos, resulting in a future mired in hubris and incompetence. The two men who had fought a business war, both on and off the pitch, came together with a shared desire to lead the way and further modernise the game. Rangers and Celtic are the biggest clubs, and I think we are both showing a very responsible attitude. There aren't really any serious other options on this plan. We must help the whole of Scottish football. In August 1998, the next major stage of the modernisation plan began, with the newly formed Scottish Premier League. The new championship had a multi-million pound television deal in place, ensuring increased revenue for the clubs. The fraught relationship between money, football and television was to have a major influence on the next chapter in the history of Scotland's game. The Scottish Premier League is underway. It was an absolute Ponzi scheme. It was a con of the worst kind. We have entered into commercialism. We have made a deal with the devil. Morale, understandably, is not good, and there is significant unrest within the dressing room. David Murray told me he was convinced that Craig White was the answer. If Craig White was the answer, I didn't know what the question was. The big house must stay open. Scotland's game continues next Thursday at 9. More in just a moment. Gabby Logan's in charge of the Premier League show, a brand new series starting now on BBC Two Scotland.